tales for dark nights. I always loved traveling carnivals. They held a mystery to me as a child, with the way they appeared overnight in an open field. I rode my fair share of rides and even won a prize or two, but the sideshows fascinated me the most. The man who could eat anything, munching away on nails and light bulbs. The spider lady, with the body of a giant black widow and the head of a woman. I would line up to see them as many times as I could. I used to love carnivals. That changed when I was twelve. My two best friends, Tommy and Wes, excitedly pounded on the front door of my house one morning. This wasn't unusual for us. During the summer months, they practically lived at my house. My mom didn't mind. We stayed out of trouble and out of her hair. My mom opened the door, and they fluttered by with the chorus of, Good, Good morning, morning, Mrs. Tillman. Mom shook her head with a giggle, barely getting out of the way of the stampede. Morning, boys. Michael is in his room. I was sitting on my bed, still in my PJs, when the dynamic duo crashed through the door and pounced on the bed. They both spoke at the same time, making it impossible to comprehend either of them. Wes clutched a paper tightly in his hands, shaking it to me. Tommy pointed at the paper with pure glee. Waving my hands, I attempted to get their attention. I can't hear both of you at once. They stopped talking and looked at each other. A moment passed, and they both were back at it, trying to outspeak the other. Wes pointed to the flyer in his hand. Clearly, this was what they were so excited about. I took it from him. The flyer was for a new carnival that would be opening this weekend. That was just two days away. I wasn't sure why we hadn't seen any flyers previously. Usually we see the flyers a couple of weeks prior to the carnival's arrival, so maybe we just missed this one. Our town was pretty boring, so carnivals were a big deal to us kids. It was the closest some of us would ever get to seeing the world. Tommy pointed to the upper right corner of the flyer. Sneak preview, Thursday night, 10 p.m. I joined the others in the excited, unintelligible chatter. We cheered and made our plans for the evening. Convincing my mother to let me stay out late wasn't an easy task. Eventually, however, she relented on the condition that Tommy's sister, Anna, would be there. We were spending the night at Wes's house, so I also had to promise that we would be back to his house before midnight. We were set, and I agreed to allow us to tag along with her, so long as we agreed to disappear once we arrived at the carnival. She didn't want her friends to see us. We also had to find our own way home. Our parents didn't know these little details. We assumed there was no need to worry them with the little things, like the ride home. We would figure that out after the carnival. The carnival was set up on county land, just a few miles from Moses' house. If we couldn't catch a ride, we could walk. We arrived at the carnival at 9.47 p.m. Anna dropped us off by the ticket booth, then disappeared in search of her friends. The excitement grew, and we could feel the electricity in the air. The night itself was dark making the neon purple lights of the carnival all that much more brilliant. The carnival tents were a mixture of black and purple, giving them a dark yet regal property. It is true the majority of the lights were neon purple, but there were other lights mixed in. The occasional black light cast a glowing hue, making white clothing and the occasional smile light brilliantly. Neat! Tommy exclaimed. He was a man of many words, and most of them were the word neat. We purchased our tickets and waited for the gates to open. Shaking with anticipation, we stared up at the sign. It read, The Mystical Carnival. Suspend your disbelief. The same name glowed in purple neon in the center of the Ferris wheel. Over by the tilt-a-whirl, organ music danced on the night breeze. The smell of fresh popcorn and cotton candy clung to our nostrils. In one word, <laughs> it was magic. A little person, dressed in a black suit with a purple shirt, walked up to the gate and swung it open. 
He held a grumpy look on his face, but he waved us in. We smiled at him while we ran in. We skipped the ferris wheel, opting for the scrambler instead. A quick game of rock-paper-scissors helped determine who got to be in the middle seat. Nothing like smashing your buddy while spinning at high velocity. Unfortunately, I lost. Next, we took on the Viking's Revenge. The giant boat, swinging high in the air, always made me feel like losing my lunch. That is why I always wait on the cotton candy until after. 11.15 p.m. came, and I begged Wes and Tommy to go see the sideshows with me. I couldn't miss them. We settled on watching the freak show. Wes grumbled that he wanted to get in line for the Ferris wheel. We knew the truth was that he was afraid. Wes was always skittish, especially when it was so dark outside. Tommy nudged Wes in the shoulder, and he reluctantly followed us. Five minutes until showtime. A raspy voice hissed from a PA system outside the black and purple tent hosting the show. We hurried in and found seats near the front row. It was during the show that I first saw him. His name was the Cursed Mr. Mortis. He was a terribly sad-looking clown. He stood well over six feet tall, wearing a white clown costume with black frills on the collar and sleeves. His bald head, well, all his skin, in fact, was covered in white paint. Mr. Mortis's lips were nothing more than black slits, and black triangles sat above and below his eyes. He truly was a pathetic sight. When Mr. Mortis moved, I noticed the bags under his eyes and his droopy cheeks. They made his face appear to be stuck in a perpetual frown. The announcer began his introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, he paused for effect. Welcome to this very special show. Tonight, you will witness the mystical powers beyond your imagination. The announcer raised his hands above his head. All fear and watch in awe the cursed Mr. Mortis. He alone walks between the worlds of the living and the dead. The lights dimmed on the stage. Prior to this show, the cursed Mr. Mortis sat in his isolated tomb, communing with the dead. They have given him the answers to questions. Questions you have yet to ask him. A murmur went through the crowd. He wrote the answers on these poster boards set before you, prior to your arrival. Mr. Mortis stood in front of the crowd holding the large white boards. Who will be the first to tempt fate and ask him a question? The announcer asked the crowd. Wes fidgeted in his seat. I don't like this. Stop being a worrywart, said Tommy, punching Wes in the shoulder. The announcer pointed to a man in the front row in a tweed blazer. Yes, sir, ask your question. What are Saturday's winning lottery numbers? The crowd chuckled. Unfazed, Mortis turned over the first card, which read, We shall not profit off the works of the dead. The crowd laughed and clapped in amazement. Mr. Mortis said nothing. His expression never changed, although he did wag his finger at the man in the tweed jacket. The announcer interrupted the claps. The first one is always about money, folks. <laughs> Who has the next question? A woman in the back row asked the second question. How old am I? The card was turned to reveal the number 42. The woman sat down in shock. He's right. The next question came. How did my father die? A man asked. The next card flipped by Mr. Mortis read, St. Louis Car Crash. The crowd swung to the man asking the question. He's right. How did you know that? The cursed Mr. Mortis just stared at him. They whispered in awe. Everyone. Except Tommy. He leaned over Wes to me and exclaimed, They're working with the clown. This is all just a big screw job. Mr. Mortis turned his gaze to Tommy and cocked his head to the side, looking at him questioningly. The announcer chuckled and pointed to Tommy. 
I see we have some doubters. Perhaps you would like to ask a question? Tommy smirked at first, embarrassed that everyone heard him. He thought for a moment and looked back at the announcer, then to the cursed Mr. Mortis. Sure, I have a question. When will I die? Well, well, well! Now there is a juicy question, my boy. Are you sure you want the answer? Tommy nodded defiantly. Fair enough. Show him his fate, O oh cursed one. The announcer waved his hand to the clown. Mr. Mortis brought the poster board over to Tommy and handed it to him. For a moment, he leered at the boy. I half expected him to attack Tommy right there in front of everyone. But he didn't. The strange clown walked back to the stage. Tommy looked at the card and showed it to the crowd. It's blank? Tommy exclaimed. I guess the spirits didn't like your disbelief? The announcer boasted, and the crowd laughed. The brief moment of levity made even Tommy smile. But Wes didn't. Terror filled his face as Wes looked on at the poster board Tommy was holding. It wasn't blank to him. No one else seemed to notice. I didn't either, but I did see Wes turn pale. He turned from the sign towards the clown. Mr. Mortis was staring directly at him. Wes jumped out of his seat and ran from the tent. We couldn't catch Wes until we were in front of the Ferris wheel. He told us what he read on the poster. You will die tonight, boy. It looked like the words were carved by a claw instead of ink. Then that freak clown was staring at me. I didn't see anything on the sign. Maybe you thought you saw it? I tried to comfort my friend. Man, you were so freaked out! Tommy laughed. He did his job. Old Morty was trying to scare the piss out of you, and oh boy, did he! Tommy circled Wes, inspecting him. You didn't crap yourself, did you? Stop it! I didn't crap myself, and I know what I saw! Wes scowled, shoving Tommy away. I checked my watch. It was now 11.45 p.m. Anna was nowhere to be found, and any hope for a ride home was gone. Tommy and I talked Wes in to a few more rides before we left for his house. After the tilt-a-whirl, Wes seemed more like his old self. Come on, guys, let's hit the Ferris wheel before we go, Tommy said, dragging us along. We're already late, so what would it hurt to be a little later? The view from the top of the Ferris wheel was incredible. We could see for miles. The woods on the edge of the field swayed with the light breeze. To us, on the top of the world, the wind felt more like a hurricane. We were scared, but having so much fun. For a few minutes, all was good. Tommy spotted him first. A white figure standing on the edge of the woods, just outside the glow of the carnival. He was watching us. When the ride was over, we hopped off of the Ferris wheel. Tommy wanted to find the clown and confront him. But Wes and I said we just wanted to get back to his house. We were already late. Circling around the scrambler, we headed for the gate. We all came to a sudden stop, our feet planted firmly, as if the grass under our feet was holding us down. We all saw something by the exit, glowing bright from one of the black light bulbs. Another poster board leaned against the fence. Written on the poster board, in the same writing was described, were the words, Leaving so soon. Have a nice trip home. Hardly the indicting evidence of a sinister conspiracy against three boys, I know. But there it was. We rushed through the parking area to get to the road. It felt better to be back on the sidewalk and away from the cursed Mr. Mortis. It was now someone else's problem. Crossing the street, we exited the last of the light coming from the carnival. The air felt lighter here, even in the darkness. For a block, no one spoke. We were all a little freaked out. Even Tommy, who was always the bravest, or at least the most stubborn, of our group. The left side of the road offered a sidewalk and the occasional dim street light. The right side was lined by the woods. 
the same woods we spotted Mr. Mortis watching us from. We opted for the sidewalk and the safe distance from the woods. The silence was interrupted by the sounds of crunching leaves coming from the woods to our right. Our eyes scanned the woods for movement. With the wind, it was difficult to tell if anything was moving besides the trees. The crunching noise was getting closer. I was sure of it. Maybe it was fear or too many scary movies, but we just had to see what was coming. Do you see anything? I whispered to us. No, but it's moving towards that small clearing over there. Wes pointed to a break between the trees a little behind us. We watched intently, waiting for whatever it was. Something moved from the shadows into view. A long figure glided into the moonlight and paused. It's a deer. <laughs> Just a dumb deer, Tommy smiled. We smiled too over the fact that our worst fear was that we were being followed by... My thoughts cut off. Wes and I looked at Tommy in horror. Mr. Mortis stood in the shadows behind him. We were so focused on the woods that we completely missed him. Mr. Mortis made no movements, but held a long, large kitchen knife in one of his hands. I let out a scream so hard my eardrums throbbed. I'm sure my friends did as well, but I couldn't hear over my own fear. We ran, the night air rushing past. It couldn't be more than a mile to Wes's house. Turning on South Street with our backs to the woods, we peeked back to see if we were being followed. South Street offered more light, enough to tell nothing was moving behind us. What the hell, man? Did you see that freak? Tommy put his hands on his knees to catch his breath. I looked around. Oh, God, no! I pointed down the street, not in the direction we were coming from, but where we had been running to. Standing under one of the street lights was Mr. Mortis. Again, he didn't move towards us. He just watched, glaring at us with hatred. He was holding another poster, chest high. I am coming for you. How did he get in front of us? Wes screamed. Wes led us as we ducked between the houses and hopped a backyard fence. Reed Nix lives here. Maybe he will let us in? We can knock on his window. Motion lights in the backyard flashed on, cutting the darkness. Our eyes adjusted to the light. And there he stood again. Mortis's silhouette stretched across the lawn towards us. He moved forward from the shadows. His eyes... What was wrong with his eyes? They were replaced by swirling pools. Grays and blacks churned in an endless vortex. He lifted his arm and pointed at us. I don't want to die! Wes cried. The cursed Mr. Mortis pulled a knife from inside his sleeve. You won't. Tommy grabbed Wes and me by the collar, and we squeezed through a hole in the fence. Faster and faster we ran, across lawns and over trash cans. A few minutes stretched to an eternity, but we reached the safety of Wes's front door. The door swung open, and a dark silhouette filled the doorway. And relax, guys. It's my dad. Wes led us into his living room, into the safety of the light. Wes's father had been waiting up for us. A little late, isn't it, boys? Sorry, Dad. We lost track of time. We considered telling him about Mr. Mortis, but we would just sound crazy. Really, were we going to tell him about being chased by a killer clown? We went to Wes's room to crash for the night, but I doubted any of us would actually sleep. The lights were kept off. We had gotten away from Mr. Mortis, but there is no need to attract attention if he was still outside. Tommy decided taking turns watching out the window would be a good idea. We told ourselves we lost Mr. Mortis, and that there was no way the man could have kept up with us. But those eyes... Those eyes made me wonder if he was even a man. We didn't take any chances. It was my turn to watch the yard. Tommy and Wes settled in, playing Mario Kart. I couldn't help but sneak a peek. 
After all, I was the reigning champion. Yoshi and I were unbeatable. I peeked out the window quickly, eager to get back to the epic race unfolding behind me. But I couldn't. There was something on the lawn. There wasn't much light, but I could make out... a balloon. It floated just above the grass, with the string tied to the bottom dipping in and out of the grass. Besides that, it didn't move. I leaned towards my friends. Guys, there is a... balloon. Wes and Tommy paused their game, with Mario midair about to crash into Luigi's Roadster, and we all looked out the window. The balloon had moved closer. I could now see it was red. That's weird. Uh, the balloon was closer to the road just a second ago. Again, the balloon only bobbed slightly, still floating out of direct light. Trees and bushes cast shadows, and offered so many places to hide. We scanned the night, but found no clouds. The balloon drifted closer, dancing in to the glow of the light from our window. We watched as it drifted closer and closer, as some unknown force was dragging it towards us. Something about the balloon wasn't right. The latex skin seemed to move. We focused on the balloon as it drifted into the light. Oh god, it's bleeding! Wes backed away from the window. Indeed, blood ran down the sides, dripping down the string. Tommy looked at me. His bottom lip quivered. He's here. He found us. Wes whimpered behind us, but we kept our gaze on the bloody balloon outside the window, watching the dripping. Our focus wouldn't have been broken, had it not been the kicking on the floor behind us. We turned. The cursed Mr. Mortis stood behind Wes, one hand covering his mouth, the other clutching a knife which was held against Wes's throat. His eyes still glistened black spinning pools. He slid the blade against the tender flesh of Wes's neck. Wes crumbled to the floor. Mortis lunged for Tommy. No, 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 leave me alone! You killed him! You killed him! In his panic, Tommy knocked the knife from Mr. Mortis's hand. Mortis wrapped his hands around Tommy's neck and forced him to the bed. I could hear gagging and wheezing sounds. What should I do? I could run and maybe save myself. No, no, I had to fight to save my friend. The knife lay on the floor next to Wes's body. I resisted the urge to look at my friend, knowing I would lose my nerve. Grabbing the knife in hand, I plunged it into Mr. Mortis's back. Out and in, over and over, I wouldn't stop until I heard this mute freak scream. Wes's father burst into the room and turned on the lights. His son lay dead on the floor, as did Tommy on the bed. There I stood, over Tommy's lifeless body, which was now covered in puncture holes. Wes's dad threw me to the ground, knocking the knife away. My head bounced off the hardwood floor, causing me to lose consciousness. As I drifted off, my eyes fixed on the open closet door. From the darkness, the cursed Mr. Mortis stared at me, smiling. Like I said before, my family moved away after that summer. It is hard to live in a small town when your son is convicted of murdering his two closest friends. No one believed my story. Why would they? I was found standing over the bodies, holding a bloody knife. It has been 22 years, and I'm scheduled to be released next week. My family now lives in West Taylor, far away from Historia and the hate they received because of me. Mom said she can't wait for me to get out. She said she has something special planned for me. A carnival is coming to town. She knew how much I loved those.
It was the dirtiest breakup I ever went through. And honestly, it was all her fault. While I was working weekends and studying until late at the library, she was meeting other men. I found out from my friend during Christmas break who saw her leaving the theater with her arms around someone else. She begged me to forgive her and lied again about what happened. She told me it was just a class friend. Then she asked me for a second chance, which I foolishly gave her. But seeing the smile on her face when I forgave her was almost good enough to forget what had even happened. It wasn't another week before I caught her cheating again, this time on my own. It was over. She begged me even more and told me that she loved me more than anything in the world. It was an awful way to start the new semester. Adjusting to my classes while trying to move her personal belongings out of my apartment. You'd understand that I was extremely surprised and sickened to hear from her again three years later. Late at night, I received a text from an unknown number with the words, I'm sorry. After a few messages back and forth, she revealed it was her and that she wanted to apologize. The rage and disappointment I'd felt back when we broke up for the last time surged into my chest, but curiosity got the better of me. I don't ever want to see you again, I replied, while I truly wanted to see how she'd react. I understand. You never have to see me again. I only wish I could have proven my love for you. Instead, I only hurt you. I'm so sorry. Her words didn't do much to melt the years of hatred I had built up, but my heart was beating fast with both anger and regret. What if I had misunderstood something? Why would she try to do this to me again? I don't want to see you again, but I accept your apology. Goodbye. I sent my last message to her and went to bed, placing my phone on the nightstand. Immediately, my phone vibrated, but I ignored it and tried to sleep. Two hours later and still unable to fall asleep from anxiety, I picked up the phone and opened her reply. Please let me make it up to you. I need to do this for myself. I promise to never contact you again. Please. She texted me her address and a time for the next day, and told me to set aside an hour for dinner. Although I did not want to see her again, I felt compelled to at least show up. At worst, I'd feel angry towards her again and leave her for good. Again. At best, I could receive some closure on something that had been bothering me ever since. I agreed to meet her one final time. I arrived on time in front of a small, old apartment complex and walked up a set of rusty metal stairs to the third floor where her apartment door was. In college, she was a straight-A student, majoring in economics, so this wasn't at all the kind of place I pictured her living. I rang the doorbell and heard a faint voice from behind tell me to come in. Upon entering her apartment and closing the door, I noticed that it was dark. Only a set of three candles were lit on the dinner table, and there she was, sitting down facing me. Steaks and vegetables were laid out nicely on two plates, and an unopened bottle of wine was in the center of the table. Sit down, please, and I'll make it quick, she said. This was the first time I'd even heard her voice in three years, and it had gotten a bit deeper than I remember. Long time no see. I tried to break the ice. Did you make this? I took the chair across from her. The eerie atmosphere was creeping me out, but the food didn't look too bad. I really only wanted to say how sorry I am. You don't have to forgive me or do anything for me now. It's... okay. I looked down at my plate and picked up a fork. And all I could think about since we broke up was... She paused for a moment. I tried one of the baby carrots. It was buttery and soft. And all I could think about was that you never believed that I loved you. It's not that. We were a couple. How could you have loved me if you cheated on me? Unlike before, this time I was prepared for her lies. I wasn't going to take them. I was going to call her out as soon as she said her next sentence. I gripped my fork and took a bite of the steak. It bled into my mouth and was juicy and delicious. I picked up a piece of broccoli and was about to put it into my mouth when she finally answered. I told you I didn't cheat on you, but I lied about that. 
I was cheating on you. Actually, I was being paid to date other men for my father's company. I didn't want to do it, but the money was good, and it helped my father get a better position at his company. I took a bite of the broccoli. She continued. And after the first time, I thought everything would be okay. I wasn't thinking about you. I wasn't thinking about us. I just wasn't thinking. I was so, so stupid. I was so mean to you. I put down the fork, but couldn't get any words out of my mouth. She had never told me any of this. Why didn't you tell me this before? I picked up the broccoli and continued eating to hide how upset I was. The faster I finished, the faster I could leave and be back on my way, and the sooner I could be free from her for good. I didn't want to tell you. It felt worse than cheating on you with regular guys. I knew you'd think I was some kind of prostitute. I was, and I regret it every day. You never knew I loved you. Only you. I would give anything to you, even myself. There's nothing I wouldn't do to be with you. I could see tears welling up around her eyes, and I almost wanted to forgive her. But the years of anger and regret wouldn't let me. I stood up and started for the door. My feet were willing to act even before my mouth could. That's when I saw her wheelchair. She rolled out from behind the dinner table to call out to me. Wait, don't go! She cried out. I stopped and turned around. Then I froze. She was completely missing her right leg from her thigh and below. Oh, my. What happened? Did you have an accident? Yes, sort of. But it looks worse than it is. A tear ran down her cheeks. I had a small car accident, and I was in the hospital. It happened last week. Oh, no. I'm sorry that happened, I told her. Despite never wanting to see her again, I didn't want to see her in pain. It's okay. I only had a concussion. But while I was out, I had a dream. And I saw you. She smiled at me. And I remembered everything that we did and everything that I did. Everything I did to you was so wrong. And I just started crying as soon as I woke up in the hospital. I wanted, no, needed to show you how much I loved you. So that you could know it wasn't your fault. It was your fault. You cheated on me. I held back tears and turned back to the door. You don't have to forgive me. I already told you that. She wiped away her tears. Then she smiled slightly and asked me, But was I good? What? I was taken back by the odd question. Was she referring to our midnight makeout sessions? I couldn't even remember but a few. The dinner. The steak. My stomach turned. Now you know, don't you? You have to know. I love you. I'd give you anything. Even myself. Even my body. I looked down at her missing leg, and my vision started to blur as I stepped back. And now I'll always be with you. I threw the door open and ran down the stairs to my car. Everything from then on happened so fast that I can't remember any of it. Somehow, I got home safely. I crawled into my bathroom on my hands and knees and threw up until I passed out. The next morning, I blocked her phone number and considered changing my own, but this was a bit of an overreaction on my part. After all, I hadn't seen her in three years, and my only memories of her were covered in a cloud of rage. This took time to pass. In fact, it took a month for it to pass, and I can't believe this would be happening, but tomorrow we'll have our first date in over three years. I'm meeting her at the mall. It's the same place we first met, and we're going to start again, slow. After all, now I can see things clearly. I know that she truly loves me.
I'm a first year resident at the local hospital, so I often work long hours and I'm always sleep deprived. I do make decent money, if not nearly as much as a licensed doctor, but on account of student loans I live in a crappy apartment. The bedroom of this apartment is tiny and the only spot for my dresser is immediately to the right of the entrance. It's just a bit too long for the space, so the door only opens halfway before it starts pressing against the corner of the dresser, and it makes an awful splintering noise when you've gone too far. This happened often enough on my first month here that I've already left some big dimples in the wood. Outside, the bathroom is just down the hall on the left, the living room on the right. The hallway is just wide enough for the bedroom door, with a couple of inches leeway on either side for the frame. Why is this important? About two weeks ago, the door to my bedroom moved. I'm not sure how else to describe it. I had just worked my second 30-hour shift in three days, and on four hours of sleep I was getting up for another one. When I pulled open the bedroom door, something struck me as off, and it took me a minute to realize what it was. The door had opened completely. I looked to see what had happened discovering that while my dresser was still flush against both walls, there was an extra inch of space between the dresser and the door. I shrugged, chalked it up to some fluke of the apartment walls, and proceeded down the hall to shower before heading into work. When I got home some thirty hours later, exhausted and desperate for sleep, the door was pushing against the dresser, same as always. Nothing unusual happened for a couple of days, but on Thursday morning I was going out for another long shift when the door opened even wider. It looked like the doorway had shifted even farther left, far enough that I could see a half inch of the hallway wall sticking out beyond the door frame. It was as though the contractor had miscalculated when he built the place, slightly displacing the doorway from the hall. An inch more and I'd have been able to see insulation and wiring. I stared at that sliver of drywall for a few minutes, dumbfounded, while my mind tried to come up with some rational explanations. The building was old, settling, and this was just the result of natural wall tensions easing. This disjunction had been there this whole time, and I had been too busy or too tired to notice. I had slept through an earthquake, during which my room got displaced a couple inches from the hall. All of the explanations seemed plausible. With work coming up in half an hour, I really just wanted to get some coffee and get out of there, so I decided to call the super after I got off. However, when I got home the next morning, the door was back to normal, and I was tired enough to not even care. Everything was ordinary for the next day, too. On Saturday, I was headed to the hospital again, when I found that, although my door only opened halfway, grinding against the dresser as usual, the hallway itself had shifted a good foot. The entire wall, and then some, was clearly visible. To the left of the wall, where I should have been looking into my bathroom, there was this black, inch-wide gap. The light from my room only went a couple of inches into that shadowy space, but I could see a floor that looked to be made of concrete, smooth, featureless, and gray. This musty smell emanated from the inside, like from an old, dry basement or maybe an attic that had been left untouched for too long. My first instinct was to just close the door. Clearly this was a hallucination brought on by working too many hours with too little sleep, but the doorknob clattered against solid drywall. My door wouldn't close. Confused and more than a little disturbed, I initially thought to just leave, get the hell out of there and worry about the details later. The need for a rational explanation, however... Coupled with a morbid sense of curiosity, it kept me from bolting out the front door. I called out of work for the first time in almost a year, saying that a pipe had burst in my apartment and that I needed to let the repairman in to fix it. Next, I called the super and asked him to come by. Then, while waiting for him to arrive, I shined a flashlight into that sliver of space. There wasn't much to see. The area ended at a cinder block wall, roughly where my hallway turned, and although I was blocked from seeing how far the room extended to the left, I got the impression that it was big. Maybe bigger than my entire apartment. Even if I was wrong, though, the fact remained that there was a strange space where my bathroom was clearly supposed to be. I even looked to be sure. Everything looked perfectly ordinary from my bathroom. The super arrived less than half an hour later, but in the time it took for me to answer the door and escort him back to my room, 
everything had gone back to normal. As you can imagine, I got pretty agitated, even frantic. However, when the Super saw how upset I was, he actually asked me outright whether or not the walls seemed to be moving on their own. While I gaped at him, he explained that the previous tenant, a young woman who had also worked at the hospital, had complained to him about something similar. She had claimed that the walls sometimes extended an inch or more past the frame of the doorway, but whenever he came to investigate, nothing was out of the ordinary. The young woman eventually became hysterical, on the verge of moving out, but at his suggestion, took a leave of absence from the hospital instead. After that, there had been no more complaints. She stayed until her lease was up and then left without incident. The super gave me a sympathetic look after he told me this story, and asked whether I had been working particularly long hours recently, or perhaps also felt trapped in my work schedule. I mean, what could I say to that? I agreed with him, informed him that I would be taking a break from work as well, and apologized for wasting his time. The super was cool about it, since I guess he had experience with this sort of thing, and even said that he was glad to help that the hospitals work us residents too hard. After he left, I called work to let them know I'd be out tomorrow as well, and then decided to turn in early to make up for some lost sleep. It was nearly midnight when I awakened. I had been dreaming about something. I don't remember what it was, but it must have been a nightmare because I woke with this sense of utter dread washing over me. It was like when you're alone in the early hours of the morning, silence hanging over your room like a sheet, and out of nowhere you get the feeling that someone is in the room with you, standing behind you, watching you. That was the feeling I had upon waking up in the stillness of my bedroom at midnight. And then I heard the scratching. It was faint at first, so faint that I thought that I was imagining it, but gradually grew in volume until it was clearly audible from across the room. Something was scratching at my bedroom door. That in itself shouldn't have been so alarming. I'd had mouse troubles at the apartment before. I'd even heard them scratching at the walls at odd hours of the night. After the events of the previous days, however, the sound jolted me awake, that sense of dread deepening into real fear. I slowly got out of bed and tiptoed toward my door. Up close, the sound was unmistakable. The scratching was coming from the bottom of the other side. Well, mouse or not, I reached over and quietly as I could, locked the door. Then I grabbed the flashlight from the top drawer of my dresser, got onto my hands and knees, and shined it through the half-inch space underneath the door. The scratching stopped almost immediately. Then something reached in through the bottom of the door. I was so startled for a moment that I didn't even realize what it was, and then it felt like someone had punched me in the gut. Three fingertips curled against the bottom of my doorframe, wiggling slightly as though trying to push the door open. The fingers were gray and skeletally thin, stained the rusty brown any medical student could tell you was dried blood. Their nails were long and ragged, clearly broken numerous times, with the splitting and pitting characteristic of malnutrition. And then I heard something else coming from just outside, carried on that musty, dry basement smell. Help me. The voice was so soft as to barely be audible, but it was clearly a woman, and I could hear panic running through it, quiet sobs underneath the words. And then I could hear something else, a sound like soft footsteps approaching from somewhere far away. And all the while the voice continued whispering, never growing any louder, but getting more urgent, more rapid. Help me. Please, please, please help me. It's coming. Please help me, please, 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 it's coming, it's coming. Please, please, please help me, please. Then the fingers vanished, as though whomever they belonged to had been violently jerked away. I could hear the sound of something being dragged along the ground, something scraping frantically against the concrete, but that noise quickly faded into the distance. And then I heard the soft sound of footsteps approaching again. It stopped outside my door, and for a while there was only silence. Then, as I watched by the trembling light of my flashlight, the lock slowly began to turn. Somehow, it was being unlocked from the other side. 
I jumped up, slammed my shoulder against the door, dropping the flashlight in my haste, and scrambled to lock the door again. Something resisted my frenzied attempt to turn that little dial, and my fingers were so sweaty that they kept slipping off. Before I finished turning the lock, the knob twisted in my grip and whatever it was back there hit the door hard enough that the whole thing shuddered. Raw terror flooded my system, and I pushed back as hard as I could. My body leaned almost parallel to the ground, even as I continued fumbling with the lock. Whatever it was hit the door again, harder this time, such that it actually opened for a split second. I was almost sobbing at this point, but my bare feet found purchase on the linoleum floor and I shoved back with all of my strength, somehow slamming the door back closed. At the same time, my fingers were finally able to wrap themselves around the lock and turn it. Using the time that bought me, I ran to my dresser and dragged it in front of the door, then sat down with my back against it. The pounding continued, even more strongly than before, but with my dresser in the way, the door stayed closed. After a few minutes, it simply stopped, and there was another minute or two of silence before the soft sound of footsteps finally moved away. Still, I continued sitting in front of the dresser, back braced against it, too terrified to even think of opening the door or heading back to bed. The only window in my room was too small to climb through, and I'd left my phone on the kitchen counter. There was nothing to do but sit and wait, which I did until the grayish light coming through my window announced the arrival of morning. It took me a while to finally muster the courage to push the dresser aside, and even then I just stood there for a few minutes, staring at the doorknob. In the end, the need to know overcame the fear of the unknown, and I pulled the door open just a crack. My hallway sat outside, same as always, with no sign that anything was unusual. Even the other side of the door was pristine, with no evidence that any violence had been directed toward it during the evening. With the door halfway open, pressing against the dresser as usual, I slipped outside the bedroom and into the hallway, heart pounding even though I was already doubting my own mind. Could it all have been just a nightmare? Had I suffered a psychotic episode in the middle of the night, terrified of nothing more than a mouse scratching at my bedroom door? Did I spend the entire night camped out in front of my dresser on account of a hallucination? As I stood there doubting, I let my bedroom door close behind me, and my nostrils filled with that dusty basement smell. I ran. I took off into the hallway, practically clawing against the wall as I dashed for the living room and tore the front door open when I got there. Just before I launched myself outside, I heard the splintering noise of my bedroom door pressing against the back corner of my dresser. It's been over a week. I haven't gone back. Not for my things, my clothes, nothing. I'm crashing on a friend's living room couch instead. He brings me takeout when he comes home from work. I extended my leave of absence from the hospital, citing a death in the family. I tried finding the woman that used to live in my apartment, the previous tenant that had also complained about the moving walls, but her address forwarding had long since expired. Searching for her by name turned up no results. Not at any social networking site, nor search engine, nor people finder. The super didn't know any of her friends or family. I even checked the FBI's missing persons page with no luck. I hope she's out there somewhere, merely beyond my ability to find. But I have nightmares every night, ones in which those emaciated fingers and soft, pleading voice reach out to me from a dark, endless space. Still, I insist that every door in the apartment stays open, because the last time I opened the front door, there was a tiny cross-section of wall exposed, as though the doorway had been displaced a half-inch from its usual spot. The ratty double-wide burned faster than they expected, and when the whiskey-fueled flames reached the meth lab in the trailer's back bedroom, the explosion was likewise extraordinary. Hicks gulped the last of the Jack Daniels and wiped his mouth with his hand. The flames were warm against his shirtless torso, his muscles hard and lean from his most recent turn inside. He leaned back in the Mustang's hood, Feeling toasty, inside and out, 
as he was tickled by the heat of the fire and the fuzzy embrace of booze. He ran a hand over his fresh buzz cut, crossed one booted ankle over the other, and casually lobbed the empty bottle into the fire. He cast an admiring glance at Dakota. He looked hot, like something out of a vintage heavy metal video, standing near the trunk in tight jeans and black boots and a tank top. Platinum highlights streaked through his long, raven-hued hair. Dakota hugged himself and watched his childhood home burn, a cocky smirk on his glossy lips. Hicks felt something at his feet and looked down to see a fat orange cat roaming against him. He kicked it, though not hard. It hissed. He chuckled. Dakota stepped over and slapped his shoulder and picked the cat up. Asshole, Dakota said, nuzzling it lovingly. Be nice to my pussy. Hicks shoved off from the car and pulled Dakota close. The warm cat pressed between them. He grabbed a handful of that luscious, dark hair and pulled, just hard enough, just the way that Dakota liked, and he said, Fuck your pussy. Dakota's tongue snaked out and licked Hicks's stubbly chin. Promises, promises. First things first, Hicks said. They kissed, the fire roaring before them. First, we see the Duke. I saw this shit. He looked at Dakota, looked him up and down real slow, like he enjoyed every inch of the view. Then, we'll take care of the rest. Hicks opened the passenger door and Dakota slid in, petting the cat gently. Hicks slammed it shut and walked around, grabbing his jacket from the top of a pile of bags in the back seat through the open window. It wasn't much to look at now, but it was everything worth taking from this place. Plus, a shitload of crystal. Whatever else he'd been before he became barbecue, Dakota's father had been a hell of a cook. He'd offered up his whole stash before Hicks had introduced his face to a shotgun. A right nice gesture, really. Of course, they were taking the stuff anyway. And his money. And his guns. His blubbery apologies were years too late for Dakota, and Hicks had done worse things for less worthy causes. Killing that son of a bitch had been just the cherry on the Sayonara Sunday on their way out of this pit. That was so hot, babe, Dakota said. The way you made him cry. Hicks put on his coat and slipped into the driver's seat, gunned the engine and spared one more look at the conflagration. Didn't I tell you I'd take care of it? Dakota hugged the cat. Do you love me? All the way, baby, Hicks said. Till the road runs out. He threw the hot rod in gear, peeled out and made for the highway, bearing down hard, chasing, and finally gaining on. His own little bloody slice of the American dream... The Mustang devoured the road. The engine roared like a hungry beast as they sped west into the humid North Florida night. Hicks turned his head and Dakota slipped a Marlboro between his lips, holding out the flaming Zippo. He sucked deep, pressed down on the gas. Ozzy wailed from the radio. Waffles slept on the bags. What kind of a name is Waffles for cat? Hicks said. Dakota only shook his head patronizingly, as if the question were far too stupid to bother with, and he lit a cigarette for himself. Hicks said, It's a good thing you're pretty. Dakota rolled his sparkly eyes and smiled. He could be on his way to the grocery store instead of fleeing a murder scene. Hicks liked that. He'd been concerned that Dakota was all talk in the joint, and he'd watched real close for signs of doubt back at the trailer. When Dakota kicked things off, breaking a lamp over dear old daddy's head, Hicks had known he was for real, and he had been glad. He'd had every intention of making off with the goods either way, really. Alone, if need be. But that's not how he wanted it. Definitely not anymore. Hicks wasn't nervous either. He felt no guilt. 
The speeding was more for the joy of the ride and his love of his car and the rush of newly reclaimed freedom than fear of getting caught. The cops didn't come out here unless they had to. No neighbors in the trailer park would have called them. They all had secrets of their own to hide. The fire department would come, but even after they found the body, it would look like another meth lab accident. By the time the so-called authorities figured out how Brad Chambers actually bought it, well, they'd be long gone. Hicks was calm, though he wouldn't be totally at ease until after meeting with the Duke. He didn't like drugs, and he hated drug dealers. Hated their fake-ass tough-guy posturing and drama. Still, there was nobody better to help them unload a stash this size. The money wouldn't be exactly fair, but it'd be pretty close. And for now, pretty close was close enough. He pulled a pistol from between the seats and switched it to his left hand. What are you doing? Dakota said. Hicks aimed at the highway marker and pulled the trigger without slowing down. A hole exploded in the green metal sign overhead. A crater replaced the dot above the eye. So off, <laughs> Dakota said. His flirty <laughs> giggle made Hicks think about porch swings and campfires, sunny beaches and snow on Christmas, cold beer in the morning and hot sex at night. And these were a few of his favorite things. Hicks replaced the gun. Dakota leaned over and laid on his chest, one hand moving under his jacket, lazily stroking the smiling devil tattoo on Hicks's stomach. The kid was asleep in seconds. He wasn't really a kid, of course, but he just seemed so young to Hicks that sometimes there wasn't anything else to call him. Hicks snuck a peek down feeling Dakota's warm, rhythmic breathing on his chest, and watched his lover's closed eyes twitch. He'd been sneaking glances at the kid for days, thinking about not thinking about him, after Dakota first arrived inside, long before they actually met. It had been Dakota's first time in real jail, and it showed. Hicks had seen the kid take a few beatings, but he hadn't stepped in. He'd been a career con doing his own time, and he'd only wanted to be left alone. Helping people got you killed, he knew that for certain. Though, Hicks had still not been able to help himself from thinking about the new arrival with the pretty eyes. Theirs was not a meet-cute by any Hollywood standard, not even by porno standards. But we don't get to choose who we love in this world, Hicks thought. No more so than we get to choose how we meet them. He had come across two big Aryans going at the kid, and he hadn't thought twice. Having caught them with their pants actually down, he had all the advantage he needed and more. By the time the guards responded, Hicks had painted the cell in a fresh coat of red blood. To the hole he'd gone, but it was a small price to pay. When he came back to the block, Dakota was waiting for him. I started talking. When Hicks got out, there were letters. Letters became phone calls. Phone calls became visits. By the time Hicks got out, they'd had a plan. He made a few calls, picked up his car, and come calling on Dakota. Happiness isn't just for pretty people, Hicks thought. It's not just for rich people, smart people, or even just for nice people. After a lifetime of tough breaks and raw deals, bad choices and worse luck, he figured it was only fair that even a broken down con inching ever further past 40 had the right to a shot at some happiness in this fucked up world. Everyone should get a chance. And this was his. He knew he wouldn't get another. But that was okay. One was all he needed. He'd always been a good shot. A solitary figure was stumbling down the dirt road. Hicks could smell his happy ending begin to rot. There shouldn't be anybody out here, he thought. That's the point of the spot. The Duke didn't hold court in nowhere, Alabama, for the scenery. It was a lonely place, a million miles from anywhere a sane person would want to be. He flicked on the high beams, recognized the wounded man, 
and realized that, as bad as he thought it might be, it was actually much worse. He threw the car into park. Stay here, Hick said to Dakota as he grabbed the pistol and got out. Before him, the man fell to his knees in a widening pool of blood, squinting dazedly into the car's lights. Georgie, Hick said, kneeling to look the man over closely. It's Hicks. What happened? Where's your brother? Where's Duke? Slowly, Georgie turned to look at Hicks, and his bruised lips spread into a lazy smile. I got good, he said, <laughs> voice cracking with a sudden, tittering giggle. I got good, Hicks. So much guts. <laughs> and he really did. They were in his hands. Cupped near his waist, Georgie carried two handfuls of dripping intestines. A few loose ends dangled absently, having slipped through his fingers. Blood and bile oozed out of the ragged gash in his stomach beneath a silk shirt that had once been white. Dakota's door opened, but Hicks waved him back. He grabbed Georgie's shoulder and shook him. Where's Duke? Who did this? Santa Morte, Georgie whispered. As cold as it was, Hicks' heart was gripped by icy fingers of fear at the words. Saint Death. A folktale god, deity of the damned, the skeletal Madonna had become the patron saint of murderers, drug dealers, and even more deranged members of the underworld. Hicks had seen tattoos and prayer cards in the joint. Most of it was harmless. A sort of grassroots religion among the new outlaw class. But, like all religions, it had fanatics. And they were true maniacs. This was as ugly as it could be. Legit deathheads were bad news. A cult of criminals who worshipped the Grim Reaper. If Duke and his boys had run afoul of lunatics like that, there would be nothing left of them to save. Not that Hicks was interested in coming to their rescue. What he wanted was much more practical than salvation. Georgie, Hicks said. Did Duke bring the money? No answer. The gutted man swayed on his knees, stared into the headlights. Hicks tried again. Did Duke bring the money? Is it still at the spot? Georgie retched, the bloody vomit spilling over the mound of exposed guts he cradled in his arms. Hicks grabbed the man's slim ponytail, jerked his head back and pressed the pistol to Georgie's crotch. He spoke very slowly. Is my money still at the spot? Bot. Answer me, Georgie, or I swear I'll bury your balls with whatever's left of your brother. Georgie nodded. He brings it. Now, tell me where. You're not serious, Dakota said. We can't. We can't, Hicks agreed, pushing the Mustang off the dirt road. I can. Bullshit. We can't make a new life with fifty grand worth of ice. We need money. I'm going to. Dakota reached into the back seat and grabbed the shotgun. No, Hicks said. I'm just going to have a look. Then there's no reason I can't go. Georgie moaned from the passenger seat. Oh. Hicks said, Don't you bleed in my car, you stupid spick. Dakota held the gun by the slide and cocked it with one hand. He reached for the blue duffel bag that held the others and slung it over his shoulder, then smiled and blew Hicks a kiss. Sissy. Bitch, Hicks said. The night wind swept through the sparse trees and silence held sway over the world. One shot, Hicks thought. Make it count. Fine. Let's do this. Waffles meowed in the back seat as he watched them leave, and Hicks couldn't help but wonder, 
Was the fat bastard shouting encouragement? Or a warning at their backs? The bonfire in the center of the circled vehicles burned bright, fueled by the bodies of slain cartel members and the wood and shrubbery gathered beneath them. Duke and his entire gang were crucified, hoisted up on makeshift timber crosses, blazing away before the writhing orgy of carnage below them. A pyromaniac's version of Jesus. Hicks smelled the charred flesh before he saw it. He expected the worst, and he was not disappointed. At his side he heard Dakota gag. On the ground, the death's heads painted each other with the innards of another body. They were naked, emaciated, and awful to look upon. Their skeletal fingers tore slippery pieces from the gaping wound at the dead man's belly, smearing themselves with gore. The body had no head. Hicks saw three of the psychos off to the left, kicking something around like a soccer ball. Something with long, dark hair. A putrid corpse dressed in white robes sat before the fire and the burning bodies in a ratty armchair. Dead flowers, along with severed body parts, were scattered around it. Burning red candles encircled the cult's dreadful idol as it watched over the ritual. Hicks and Dakota sank to the ground outside the light of the fire. Hicks counted at least eight of the cultists, maybe more in the clearing. Even if there had been nine or ten enemies, he might not have hesitated to take them on alone, armed as he was. He'd beaten worse odds. But death heads were something else. Hicks eyed a black Durango with tinted windows on the far side of the fire. There it is. That's where Georgie said it'd be. Dakota shook his head. No way. I'm getting what we came here for. We don't need it. We've got cash already. Not enough. A wail rose up from the gathering by the fire as the death heads finally clawed the eviscerated corpse apart. Fuck it. Dakota said. We'll figure something out. Let's just dump the drugs and bail. But the kid didn't get it. He couldn't possibly understand what it had taken Hicks a lifetime of eating shit to learn. Starting fresh, hitting the road with nothing, is only exciting when you're young. But after starting from scratch again and again, after having nothing for so long, Hicks knew it wouldn't work. Not in the long run. Not this time. This time. It was for keeps. Until the road runs out. Right? This was a shot. He was going to do it right. And that included getting the money. They've said that hope is free. That it didn't cost anything to have faith. It's all bullshit, of course. Hicks knew they were full of it. Whoever they were. And that hope was plenty expensive. A clean start. Safe home, doctors, all the operations, the life that Dakota wanted, that he deserved. Hicks tallied these mounting aspirations in his mind's ledger. A better tomorrow costs money. There was a whole lot of hope in the gutter. Hicks had spent enough time there to know. Go back and start the car, he said. Be ready. Hicks grabbed the bag, got up and moved into the darkness before Dakota could say anything else. He knew that if he gave himself half a chance, he'd stay. He'd give in, and they'd leave with nothing. He walked fast, making his way around the edge of the firelight and staying behind the cars when he could. Dakota's scared, pretty eyes burned in his mind, and the shrieks of the maniacs rang in his ears. Just one more bad thing, Hicks told himself. Just be that guy one more time, and you'll have the rest of your life, your real life, and it starts today to get over it.
Better men have done worse things. Hicks reached the Durango and opened the door without being seen. He found the suitcase in the back seat, just like Georgie would said he would. He opened it and began stacking packs of bills into the duffel bag beside the guns. Every squeal and scream from the fire made him jump. When he was finally done, he started back. About fifteen feet from the SUV, something struck the ground to his left. The head. A wild kick had sent the dusty, severed head flying high, arcing through the air to land, bounce, and roll to a stop right next to him. The colt was quiet as all eighteen of their hollow eyes turned and stared at him in unison. Hicks leveled the shotgun. The death heads fanned out and began to approach. Hicks thought of ordering them back and dismissed it. Even if they understood, they really wouldn't care about his threats. They loved death. What other threat could he offer? He tucked the shotgun under his arm and drew two pistols from his jacket pockets. The death heads were closing in fast, clawing their own flesh with sharp, dirty fingernails, working themselves up into a frenzy of bloodlust. Hicks opened fire. A tall, bald man on his far left took the first shot in the chest and went down quick. On his right, Hicks managed to hit a woman in the shoulder. She spun around and fell, but kept crawling toward him. His second shot found her head. Hicks kept shooting as he backed toward the Durango. The seven left were spread further out now, flanking him in the darkness like Halloween decorations come to life. He kept shooting at the four he could see. Reaching the car, Hicks dropped the bag of money and the shotgun by his feet. He rested against the vehicle and sighted a man with a grisly beard. The first shot hit his chest. The second hit his neck. Hicks moved on instantly to a young girl nearing him on his right. She was close. He could smell her. The reek of shit, blood, and vomit made his eyes water. He pulled the trigger and the gun clicked empty. He tossed it. Tried the other one. Same story. He reached down and came up with the shotgun just as she lunged, emptying both barrels into her stomach and cutting her in half in midair. Splattered with a warm rain of blood and guts, Hicks dropped the empty shotgun and pulled another pistol from the bag. The only sound as he scanned the dark was the crackling of the fire. Pain erupted in his shoulder, and Hicks screamed. From the roof of the Durango, a young boy wearing a necklace of bones raised a long wooden spear and plunged it down again. Hicks tried to duck, but the spear sank into his back. He stepped away and shot the boy saw him fall silently from the roof. Suddenly, he was knocked to the ground. The spear fell from his back and the wind rushed from his lungs. A big man loomed over him, brandishing a machete. Hicks raised the pistol, but the lunatic brought the large blade down onto the back of his hand. Several of his fingers fell away cleanly, and Hicks saw himself drop the gun. With a shrill cry mismatched to his size, the man raised the blade high above his head. Hicks, half blind with pain and struggling to breathe, kicked as hard as he could up towards the man's dangling genitals. The big man doubled over, clutching himself, as Hicks rolled out of reach. Getting shakily to his feet, Hicks saw the other three coming closer. Two women and a man with his long hair slicked back and shiny with fresh blood. Hicks reached into his boot and pulled out his hunting knife, tucking his wounded hand close to his chest. A sound erupted from the far side of the fire then, one Hicks knew well. Two bright spotlights grew large in the dark as Hicks' car burst over the hillside, flying through the air like a V8-powered magic carpet. The Mustang came down hard and clipped the seated corpse idol. It sailed into the fire, chair and all, as the car skidded to a stop, flinging dust and gravel. Hicks smiled as he saw Dakota at the wheel, looking mad as hell. He leapt out, blasting away with a sawed-off pump action like he'd been born to do it. The girl scattered, and the long-haired man scurried behind a nearby pickup. The big man with the machete, though, having recovered from the shot he'd taken to the balls, 
ran straight at Hicks. Dakota, too far away to shoot without hitting Hicks, watched him and the man with the machete meet in a bone-snapping collision. The big man landed on top of Hicks, who thrust his blade desperately up, gouging into the lunatic's left eye. Distantly, he felt the rusty blade of the machete push deep into his stomach, an enormous pressure crushing his neck. His vision failing, Hicks tore his knife free from the big man's eye socket and stabbed it into the side of his neck, pulling as hard as he could. The death head's throat ripped apart like a soggy garbage bag, spilling blood and stringy bits of muscle and flesh down onto Hicks's face. Still, the maniac squeezed harder at his throat and pushed the machete up deeper into Hicks's belly. It felt like the tip was in his chest, poking a lung. Every breath was agony. The handle jutted out from the mouth of his laughing devil tattoo like a strange black tongue. Dakota appeared above them suddenly and emptied a small twenty-two pistol into the big man's back. The maniac finally slumped over and was still, and Hicks fell into blackness. The screech of jamming gears roused Hicks. He forced his eyes open and saw the world rushing past outside the car. His hands were heavy in his lap, one wrapped in a stained sweatshirt and throbbing. A sticky, warm puddle squished beneath his ass as he tried to sit up. Pain. Indescribable pain. Pushed him back down. Hold on! Dakota yelled, tears streaming from his eyes. His foot slammed the gas pedal to the floor. Hold on, Hicks! Hicks tried to speak, but found his tongue was too heavy. He blinked hard and saw the blue bag at his feet. Feet he could not move, spilling over with cash. The kid would be okay. He could be anything he wanted now whoever he wanted to be. In countless mirror and window reflections over the years to come, that sly, sexy, beautiful smile would be Hicks's memorial. On whatever face the kid chose, beneath any hair, that smile would sit resolutely below those wonderful, sparkly eyes, just for him. Not a bad legacy, Hicks thought. Better men have checked out with less. And where was Georgie? Only Waffle stared back at him from the back seat, ambivalent, as if he were not surprised by these recent grim developments. Hicks decided that he didn't care. It was getting hard to focus. He threw up, and spit and blood spilled down over his chest. It pulled in his lap on the already sodden blanket that was wrapped tightly around him like a big plaid bandage. You just hold on, Dakota said. Just hold on, all the way, remember? Till the road runs out. But the road was ending. Dakota couldn't see it yet, but Hicks could. A large, black tunnel. It was approaching just up ahead, swallowing the horizon. They were speeding right toward it. Hicks saw the sun rising behind them in the side mirror. They were driving west. If you drive west fast enough, even at dawn, Hicks thought, it's like you're driving into the past, back into yesterday. Hicks didn't care for yesterday much. Not any of the many yesterdays he'd known. He wished he could have been born later. Ten, maybe twenty years from now. Maybe the world of tomorrow would have been his time. He'd been too early. And now, it was way too late. But maybe that's what it would take. Maybe he was the kind of guy that fueled the machines of progress. The pain flowed out of him then. Sudden as a blink. And with it, the regret. It was silly to regret. He'd had his shot, after all. The world doesn't care if you're in love. It doesn't care about your regrets or your promises. It doesn't owe you anything. The world is full of monsters. 
They grow out of slinking under beds and crouching in closets, and they get worse. Once upon a time, a little boy named Gavin Hicks had thought you could beat those monsters if you were tough enough. If you made yourself scary enough. So he bloodied his knuckles, and sharpened his tongue, and cultivated a good glare and big, hate-filled muscles. He'd injected an armor of ink beneath his scar-covered flesh to hide the cracks. And it had worked. For a while. But he'd learned too late that grown-up monsters don't fight like that. They're carved of brick and steel, made of disappointment and regret. And they are relentless. In order to take down those monsters, you have to have the right ammo. You've got to be very quick. There are no second chances, none that ever really count, and it's not fair. But in the world of grown-up monsters, hate is a half-measure, and even love is most often a bullet of insufficient caliber. Maybe tomorrow would be enough. Hicks had time to hope, quickly just before the darkness got too deep, that it would. Nakoda was shouting. It sounded faint and so, so far away. They drove into the tunnel. And there was nothing but cool darkness and the lulling pulse of the engine. Oh, for God's sake. Hey, Lucifer. Did you have a nice day? Of course you did. You're just a cat. You don't have any responsibilities, unlike me. Meow. Sometimes I wish I were a cat. Then I wouldn't have screwed things up at work as usual. I wouldn't have to work at all. Look at this mess. Want some jam, Lucifer? You've got jam all over you. Huh. If Jack the Ripper had a cat. You're a piece of shit. What? Oh, must have been the TV. Hey, Lucifer. Come here. You're a worthless piece of shit. I bet you'll lose your job soon. What is it with this movie? 
hell does she want? Hello? Hi. How are you? I'm fine. I'm sorry about today. Can we talk? Over the phone? Seriously? Um, how else are we going to talk about it? Why not show some guts and talk to me face to face? I don't think that's a good idea. I am not going to discuss this over the phone. It's not like you live far away, so if you can't be bothered to show your face, then you can just- Okay, okay, I'll come over. Don't go anywhere, okay? Sure. I bet she won't come over. You can't trust her. She's going to destroy everything. Who's there? Show yourself. Hi. I thought you were never going to answer. Yeah, well, I didn't think you'd show up. Heard what happened at work today. Why didn't you let your boss know? You know I can't risk getting any more safety warnings. I'm already hanging by a thread. She's gonna turn you in. At least you didn't bring home any lab equipment and stuff from work like before. Remember? Poor Lucifer. You should never have let him play with those chemicals. What do you mean? Poor Lucifer. He's fine as a fiddle, actually. Living the good life. I even gave him some jam earlier. That's not funny! <laughs> <sighs> I see you've started drinking again. What do you care? Of course I care. Why wouldn't I? After all we've been through, I had expected you to at least try to sort yourself out. I mean, look around. This place is a mess. You're a mess. When was the last time you showered? She doesn't care about you. Nobody cares about you. Hello? Are you even listening to me? What's wrong with you, Maxwell? What? I said, what's wrong with you? You've been acting so weird lately. You are definitely going to lose your job. Why would you say that? I'm fine. I'm fine. Fine? Have you looked around you? This place is a mess. And what is it with that conversation earlier? It's like you think we're in a relationship or something. I just thought that after all this time we'd be- Oh, you thought that I wouldn't accept the job offer and stay with you? And what do you have to offer that is so much better? I mean, you're a total loser with no friends. You can't even keep a real job. What's gotten into you? Seriously, did you just come over here to yell at me? I just can't pretend anymore. I, I just... What? Just what? Spit it out! Say it! Say what? What is wrong with you? What a bitch. I know, right? You? I know what's wrong with you. It's your face. Get it together. Have you never heard a cat talk? It was you? Before? Cat got your tongue? Don't act so surprised. You know she's going to leave you and tell your boss that you screwed up again. You can't trust her. You're going to lose everything. You can't let her leave. You think so? You think she would do that? Of course. Didn't you hear her? She's going to get a new and better job, snitch to the boss, and leave you in the gutter. I don't know. She can be pretty nice sometimes, you know. Nice? You call that being nice? 
Abandoning you when you need her the most? Yeah, I don't know. I guess you're right. But how do I make her stay? Chloroform, bullet to the head, gutter insides out, you choose. You mean, kill her? Obviously. What else were you thinking? Wooing her to stay and be nice hasn't exactly worked out for you so far. You're right. And when you're right, you're right! <laughs> Maxwell? Where are you? I'm in the kitchen. Are you now gonna tell me what you're trying to say? Now's your chance. Do it. Stop her. Yeah, about that. I'm sorry. I just can't pretend like everything's fine, you know? I think it would be best for both of us this way. I mean, don't you think so? Because... Oh my god, is that a knife? You know what I think? I think you should leave! Good luck with your new job now! <laughs> Disgusting. You don't plan on keeping that disfigured corpse, do you? Don't talk about her like that! She's beautiful. Maybe her face. The rest is disgusting. Go on, you might as well save the only thing that's beautiful about her. Saw her head off. Yeah. And you wondered why she wanted to leave you. Shut up, fucking cat. Classic. Head in the fridge. Could you be any more predictable? Shut up, or you'll be next. <laughs> she can't get away now. Don't act so victorious yet. We still have the body to get rid of. I don't want to see your body. Then get rid of it, idiot. Then get rid of it, idiot. I know I'll get rid of it. By feeding it to you, you smartass. Never eat your cat food anyway. Whiskers not good enough for you? Oh, but I cut off her hand for you. I am so not surprised she wanted to leave you. Do you ever shut up? for you with this blunder she gave me! You know, I'd much rather just have whiskers. Oh, wait till you get a taste of her! God damn it, cheap piece of shit! Looks like you're gonna have some chunks in your dinner. Well, aren't you gonna taste it? Um, no. Oh, am I then supposed to get rid of the body? Maybe I could cut a thigh off and put it in the oven. Might be nice with some spices. Didn't you decide to become vegan a few weeks ago? New Year's resolution and all that? Oh yeah. Shit. I forgot. How can I get rid of the body? Maybe I could turn her into fertilizer. The plants have been looking kind of weak lately. You seriously make me sick. Excuse me? I said you make me sick. Butchering your girlfriend like that, and what now? Turn her into fertilizer? It was your idea. Mine? I'm just a cat. This is all on you, you sick bastard. Don't talk to me like that! Suit yourself. Murderer. You said that I should stop her. This was your idea, not mine. Don't walk away from me. 
I said, don't walk away from me! Watch me. I'm going to kill you! Yeah, good luck with that. I've been dead for weeks. Don't you remember that accident after your last screw-up at work? <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell Snyder, you have been found not guilty by reason of insanity. I hereby commit you to the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane until such a time as you are found to no longer be a threat to yourself or others. Order in the courtroom! Order in the courtroom! I'm free from him. He can't reach me now, that fucking cat! <laughs> Well, look what the cat's dragged in. Have you missed me? Oh, don't look so surprised. You know what they say about cats. Nine lives and all. Still got eight left in me. Now, how are we going to kill those guards? Chilling tales for dark nights. (laughs) 